Hi, I'm Antonia. This is Universally Me. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Antonia Carlotta and go join the Lemley family on Patreon. It's a great way to show your support. Plus you get tons of bonus content and access to my Universally Mini podcast with news from Universal, the horror community, the classic film world, plus more about Dracula's daughter that didn't make this video. Did you know that Universal made a lesbian vampire movie in 1936? I'm sure it sounds crazy, but I'm not even making it up. This movie has a bit of a cult following, but not nearly enough considering how good it is. I've heard of it pretty much never in the gay community and only a little bit in the horror community, but it's actually a really good movie. Today, we're talking about Dracula's Daughter. Dracula's Daughter was a universal horror film released in 1936. It was directed by Lambert Hillier, who had also directed The Invisible Ray. The movie starts right where Dracula left off. It is a true continuation of the first film. Dracula's Daughter almost wasn't a universal film. Kind of. Though Universal had bought the rights to Bram Stoker's original novel, the source material for Dracula's daughter was likely Dracula's guest, which was a chapter removed from the original novel. So though Universal owned the rights to Bram Stoker's Dracula, they didn't own the rights to that chapter specifically. David O. Selznick over at MGM bought the rights, but he was rightfully a little bit worried about making a movie with Dracula in the title. Like maybe he'd get into legal trouble with Universal or they might sue him. So he sold the rights to Universal in 1934 and in 1936, they started production. It wasn't easy getting this film into production. The first few scripts that were submitted to the Hayes office were rejected for too much sex and horror. The Hayes office was also aware of the lesbian subtext of the film. They specifically asked for certain scenes to be rewritten to avoid the suggestion of a perverse sexual desire on the part of Maria, Dracula's daughter, or of any sexual attack by her upon another woman. I can tell you the rewrites may have happened, but they weren't successful. There is still plenty of suggestion and sexuality. Another hurdle came in finding a director. Uncle Carl and Jr. really wanted James Whale to direct, especially coming off his success with Bride of Frankenstein. But James Whale was concerned about directing too many horror films in a row, and he really wanted to work on Showboat instead. I would have loved to see James Whale's take on this movie. First, because he was an openly gay director in the 1930s, so it would have been amazing to get his perspective for that alone. But also, this movie has some comedic moments in it, some that work better than others, and I would have loved to see his take on those. Dracula's Daughter was one of my Uncle Carl and Junior's last movies at Universal, and it was Universal's last horror movie for the next few years. With the Hayes Code finally being enforced and the Legion of Decency threatening boycotts against any movie they didn't approve of, studios couldn't really afford to take those kinds of risks anymore but Dracula's daughter just eked through. The movie follows Countess Maria Zaleska, the daughter of Count Dracula, who has inherited her father's thirst for blood, though she doesn't want it. She hears of her father's death and she believes her curse may be lifted, but when it's not, she enlists the help of a psychiatrist whom she hopes will cure her. Already, it's easy to see the parallel to somebody contending with their own gay thoughts thinking that they're wrong or not wanting them anymore. Maria talks about her vampiric urges that she's been cursed with and she doesn't want them. She wants to be free to live as a woman, to be open, to be normal and have normal thoughts. A tale as old as time. Countess Maria is played by Gloria Holden and she really is so strong in this role. She has a great mesmerizing quality. This is one of her first roles, so I would be really curious how Junior Lemley found her and decided to hire her. Universal essentially took a chance on a lesser known actor, just as they had done with Bela Lugosi and Dracula, and once again, it paid off. Unlike her father, Dracula, who leaned into his identity as a vampire with his big cobwebbed castle, his animals, his cape, his distinct speech patterns, Maria appears to try to blend in as much as possible. She doesn't have the Transylvanian accent. 
Her outfits, though dark, are still conventionally beautiful, and her apartment in Chelsea could be anybody's apartment. Nothing eerie or haunted in sight. If you ask me, it sounds like internalized homophobia, or I guess internalized vampirophobia. Maria hides the parts of her that make her different, assimilating into society around her. One of my favorite scenes in the film comes about 15 minutes in. Maria is playing piano with her assistant Sander listening nearby, waiting for night to fall so she'll know if her curse is truly broken. As she tells him her hopes for a normal life, he counters everything with something dark and contrarian. Notice how he talks in her ear here. She never makes eye contact. Is he the outer depiction of her inner demon? Is that the conflict in her mind? When they finally make eye contact, she asks what he sees and he says, death. In that moment, she understands the truth. The curse isn't broken and she's still the same person. Maria seeks the help of Dr. Garth to cure her of her curse after he explains that he believes any disease of the mind or obsession can be cured through what he calls sympathetic treatment. When they meet, he actually encourages Maria not to avoid her temptations, but to meet them and fight them. If her mind is strong enough, he thinks that she'll be able to overcome her urges, but will soon find that maybe she can't resist temptation. The movie doesn't make any effort to hide that women are just as enchanted by Maria as men, almost fawning over her. And women who don't get her attention seem kind of jealous or upset about it. When Maria goes after men in the movie, it's always quick, no feeling, just necessity. But when she goes after women, it's so much more slow and seductive. There's all of this tension and feeling attached to it. Soon after meeting with the psychiatrist, Maria's assistant brings a young woman back to her art studio. In exchange for food and water, the young woman will pose for one of Maria's paintings. And this scene is probably one of the most overtly sexual and homosexual scenes in the film. The woman is visibly nervous. She's given wine and some food, and Maria compliments her and then tells her that she'll be painting her head and her shoulders and asks her to undress. I honestly don't know how this made it past the censors. The girl emerges with just a lacy undershirt on. She takes the straps down on her top and the back is pretty much open. Maria gives her some more wine and tells her to stand by the fire and as the girl begins to get uneasy, Maria tries to hypnotize her with her ring. Maria slowly closes in on the girl and the camera pans up as we hear a blood curdling scream. Maria failed. She couldn't resist temptation and she's becoming increasingly hopeless. And I don't really want to spoil the end of the movie, so I guess I'll just say go watch it. As a standalone film, it's incredible. As a sequel, it's incredible. So actually, 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 I'm going to change my mind right now. I am going to spoil this movie. So if you don't want to be spoiled, go watch the movie right now and then come back. Otherwise, spoiler alert, Maria dies in the end. And in some ways, this is just your classic, like the monster dying at the end of the movie. But actually, this is also an element of the Hayes Code that became a trope that is still excessively perpetuated in lesbian media today. It's called Barrier Gaze, and it's this crazy phenomena where more than one third of lesbian characters in TV and movies die, and less than 10% get to have a happy ending. And whether or not people realize it, this kind of has its roots in the Hayes Code, where anybody who was considered deviant or immoral they couldn't have a happy ending. So in 1936, when the Hayes Code is just starting to be enforced, Maria had to die as a consequence for her lesbianism and for being a monster. But in this case, that's just a metaphor for being a lesbian. In its promotion, Universal played up the sexuality in Dracula's Daughter. Their tagline said things like, she gives you that weird feeling. Women obeyed her, men feared her power, and save the women of this city. 
I expected to see more outrage in the reviews for this movie. People who were uncomfortable with the level of sexuality in the film, with the lesbian subtext in the film, or with the level of horror aimed predominantly at women. But I only really saw one or two reviews that even pointed out that lesbian subtext. I saw more than one review that actually recommended people bring their kids to the show, so I don't know what that's about. Though most people probably haven't heard of Dracula's Daughter, it's still an important and influential movie. Anne Rice said Dracula's Daughter was direct inspiration for her own work, and she even named a bar in Queen of the Damned, Dracula's Daughter. While Carmilla was the first lesbian vampire, Dracula's Daughter was the first in film, and all lesbian vampires since owe Dracula's Daughter for paving the way. In the comments, tell me your thoughts on Dracula's Daughter. Also tell me your favorite female vampire films and your favorite lesbian vampire films, if they exist. Also don't forget to become a member of the Lemley family on Patreon. It's an amazing way to support my work and you can get my Universally Mini podcast. This episode, I've got more about Dracula's daughter and lesbians. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Antonia Carlotta. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.